So for week two, we're talking about a couple of drawing strategies you can use. And uh, one of the ones I turn to a lot is a technique called sight size. And sight size basically just means you try and make your drawing exactly the same size and proportions as what you're looking at. And this means it's very handy because you can just go back and forth and compare the left one to the right one or the top one to the bottom. You can do this like how I'm doing it where um, my drawing, the drawing which is a uh, still life by Peter Clays is up here and mine is going to be over here. But you could also do this with your drawing here or and your subject matter over here. Or if you're right-handed, your uh, drawing over here and your subject matter over here. Sight size is a really handy technique because basically anytime you just go outside uh, and look at stuff, you're basically doing the same thing. It's just you would have your drawing here and reality is up here. And so it's a really good technique to start building your muscle memory for looking at things and figuring out where they are. And just being able to make uh, the picture plane flattened to a two-dimensional surface. And so you don't have to worry about things like perspective and construction as much because you just make yours look like theirs. Now, uh, this is something where you might have done this in other classes using like a grid system. Uh, you use this sometimes if you're enlarging things where maybe you have a series of grid lines here and you know you make each individual little box the same size. Uh, so basically you start off with this grid of eight by 10 boxes and whatever was in the eight, uh, the upper left box here, you make that same little drawing in the upper left box here. Uh, that is one method you can use. I tend to avoid it because it's a little dry. It takes a lot of work just to lay in that grid and um, you lose a lot of the spontaneity of drawing. But uh, basically, I'm just going to start by marking off my picture plane so that it's the same size as this. And there's a couple of measurement tools you can use. You can actually literally use your pencil here. And you'll note that my pencil is actually uh, exactly from the tip to the blue here. So I can just figure out where that is on my drawing here and let's see that I need to go maybe like right around here. I'm trying to once again still use my arm in less than my hand. And so this is the first start is just making sure that your proportions are kind of the same. The length and the width are kind of identical in your picture plane to this. Next I'm going to start using something called plumb lines. And a plumb line comes from the idea that like you would actually have something called a plumb bob, which would be just a big chunk of metal, and you would just hang it from a string. And because gravity goes straight down, you have this straight line that's always going to be exactly up and down, perpendicular to the horizon. And so you can use this as something where, for instance, a plumb line right through, the, let's say, the corner of this eye here. That can tell you things like, uh, well, that line goes through kind of the middle chunk of this size of feather. You can do things like a uh, horizontal plumb line and notice things like um, how does this relate to the overall picture plane. So if this is also something where this is the direct center, you might discover things like the nose bone here on this still life is directly in the center point. So maybe I'll start with that. I'm just going to mark this center line here. And using a plumb line straight down, I can see that this is going to uh, have this uh, edge of the skull here. And there's my nose, Maybe a little bit further. And so now I know where this nose is going to be. It's going to be in this uh, starting point. So you can use this for all sorts of little chunks of this, just to make plumb lines everywhere. You can see this little glass. Uh, the edge of this little pot. And so this can seem really kind of strange when you're starting off because you're not really drawing. It's like you're just making yourself a little map of where the drawing is going to be. You can also use comparative measurements. This is about, uh, well, there's this distance from the top of the skull to uh, the edge of the picture plane. And I can just try and recreate that size right there. So it's about uh, a tiny little centimeter or so. And I just make that there. So what I'm starting to have is this grid where uh, I can spot a lot of things. 
Um, doing site size for something um, vertically or like these vertical marks of where things are can be a little more difficult because we would really want to do that by comparing it over here, right? So that you could draw this line directly across. So it's a little harder to cheat. Uh, but you can, once again, divide this picture plane to kind of figure things out. So like major divisions would be, I had mentioned the center line of the nose. I'd say the book is right here. There's this like little extra shelf that you see. Uh, the glass kind of goes up to here. Maybe the glass is a little higher. The top of this ridge of his eyebrow is kind of there. And so now based on that, I can start roughing in some of those same ideas for where that is. And a lot of times this is going to surprise you. So if that's my nose, this eye is right around there. I had mentioned the glass kind of coming around here, a little higher up than the, I know. It's, uh, it's about the same as the nose. No, it's a little higher. It's kind of hard to see because this is a little dark. And so at some point, you have enough of this in place that you can start drawing. I'm looking at this little corner of this book. I draw a plumb line down, and I know that it's kind of like the edge of the uh, table. And then there's the book. The other point is over here. So I draw a plumb line straight down. And I think about this corner of the book. Where is that in relation to the picture plane? It's about here. So right around here. Now, I think this is important because what you're essentially doing is a comparison of addition versus division and uh, uh, addition versus division. And division is really handy. It makes sure that everything is kind of uh, based on the sum of all the parts. Whereas addition can be a really big problem where you start drawing the skull and then you draw this and then you draw the zygomatic process and further down. And you start getting feature creep. And so by drawing just a couple of guides, now I can start being a little more loosey-goosey with this. Again, here's where I said my nose is. And I'm trying to draw with my pencil kind of flat to the page. And all the time I just continue checking my plumb lines. This is sort of about that much distance down. Don't solve every problem on your first pass. You can always work your way up to it. There's this little dark shadow here. Another thing that's kind of good about this is it trains you to stop looking at stuff like it's stuff and instead look at it as zones of light and shadow or uh, light areas and dark. And if this was just an abstract series of uh, circles and squares, you might think, oh, I definitely know how to um, put that together. So this is kind of a perfect example of why site size is handy. There's this cup here, and I'm not really caring at all about how it's made out of a cylinder. I'm only caring about uh, where this ends up in the overall drawing. So I think I may have gone too high up here. I'm trying to only do one line per concept and jump around a lot. Because otherwise, a lot of times beginners will just go back and forth on the same line over and over. And you don't know if that's a good line yet. Don't commit to it until you figured out that it's in the right place. So by jumping around a little more, We can start figuring this out a little better. There's the edge of the skull. You can also get kind of better results with straight lines than with curved lines using sight size. And it gives you this sort of carving look. Um, you can always go in and round it out later. 
So this feather kind of goes right here. What's further? The nose goes down this far, and then the feather, if you use a plumb line to compare, this is where the feather, the highest point on the feather is, comparative to the nose, which is up there. So the feather needs to be slightly lower than the nose. Something like this, where it's just this shadow shape of where this ink is. Don't overthink it. Just imagine it's just a giant blob that goes like that. So at some point, you're going to have closer and closer to the finished idea of where all these things are. And then you can start resting a little bit. So this book point goes up. You know what? I think I had a fair amount of feature creep here. So this is where having loose lines is really handy and I didn't commit too hard. And I can kind of see how my skull went too far here. But using looser lines where I'm not over committing to the drawing just yet means it's a little easier to fix. So like first you figure out in proportion to the overall picture plane. Then you figure out in proportion to each other. So like this is where I could really see it. Pulling the plumb line down from it's like this little candle holder or something. I realized that plumb line was where my skull was going to be. Right around this halfway point nose. This piece of paper comes in. Now the other thing you can do if you really want to start getting fancy with this, you can continue rendering this, uh, but it's worth looking at this in terms of value now. You can have the darkest value being pitch black. You can have something that's kind of mid-tone gray and something that is a little more light and then pure white <clears throat> and at any given point of this picture ask yourself which chunk is what color and suddenly you start seeing things that are uh, really surprisingly dark so maybe you just at this point start blocking it in The region I know that's going to be full of darkness. I'll just go a little faster. Now, what about this little window here? This is kind of shaped like this. This is where um, site size is especially handy for something like a still life because you don't have to worry about every single chunk of it being correct at all times. something like this tiny little reflective detail. That's one of those things that you'll see in the real world. And with sight size, you just think, oh yes, it's there in the top one, so I'll put it in here, in the bottom one. And uh, it's a little harder to plan that sort of highlight out when you're drawing from imagination. Because we don't necessarily think about like window shapes affecting it's going down here 
So you can work on this slowly at this point. You might start shading in the eye, socket too. And this is going to really help with fixing those errors where I had too much feature creep for the skull, where it went slowly left and right more and more. So it's darker here and lighter here on the skull, which means I can kind of just lock it in real fast. And I'm starting to carve out that shape of where our skull is. So sight size is something that I highly recommend. Um, I, I think it's a good strategy for things like um, painting especially, because it means that you map out these zones of where things are gonna end up, and you keep it sort of blocked in rather than committed. And that's really important because with painting, a lot of times you go in and you just cover the drawing up with paint. And so I don't think it's worth it to um, over over render on a painting because eventually you're just gonna do the final rendering in uh, paint and so like the number one thing you need to do with a painting is start off with like these color zones blocked in let's see this glass is very very dark at this point I am thinking about drawing ideas like um, direction a little bit Stuff like um, these uh, shading lines coming out can maybe um, help tell you certain things. Now, could you draw this skull using construction? Absolutely. Uh, these little highlights here are going to be real tricky. I'm just going to go like this, block some of them in. This is something I love doing, which is if you know, if I'm going to do a full render like this, I love trying to think about um, the highlights as something that's opaque and physical. If you just put them in, something like that, then when you start shading around them, you just know the areas that you're going to leave untouched. There's other ways you could do it too, like a lot of times this might be easier just having toned paper and you put those highlights in using white up. So anytime I do like watercolors or plain air painting out in the natural world, uh, sight size is something that I usually start with because I'll do like a five minute drawing trying to get the overall block in down. There's this cast shadow coming down. Even now, I'm pretty late into this drawing and I'm still using sight size to draw. I'm thinking about plumb lines for where this uh, inking quill comes down. This whole thing with just uh, I think this is 2B lead, same lead as like a number two Ticonderoga.
Now, if I really want to go the whole way, I'm trying to think about these zones of lighter colors. Um, this would probably be easiest on toned paper. But at some point, I might find that it's a uh, something where like I might just want to block everything in. So I'm trying to figure out where these highlights are, and everything that's not those highlights, I can comfortably say is going to be shaded. So maybe you can green in like a whole picture like this, except for those highlights. It's like you're working in a uh, darker value. Uh, this little skull is really great for um, occlusions. I love skulls because they have these dark, dark contact shadows inside of their various nooks and crannies. Uh, if this was a painting, I probably would have started painting on it about five, two minutes ago, because I would have had enough drawing in that I would just assume that I could reasonably expect to succeed at it. This is kind of cool. This is a lost edge over here where the skull starts matching the thing. And by the way, there is a... Um, a version of this online that has, you know, I think the values are a little lighter. But this last edge here, the skull, is kind of the same shadow darkness as the landscape behind it. It's really fun. Now, like, they're kind of blending together. The magic of sight size for me is like all the time you start working on it and then you think, oh, if I missed this tiny detail that almost escaped me. Little highlights going along something. There are so many ways to draw, and this is just one of them, you know? I think what I'm looking for you guys this week is, I would love it. If you give Sight Size a try, and chances are you're going to come away from your first experience with it thinking, nope, I botched it. And that tends to happen. You know, I'm a pretty accomplished artist and I still botch sight size sometimes. Like right here, I think I made this too big. Now I gotta figure out what I wanna do with it. So now I'm still using this value chart and I'm just looking at this and saying, is this the darkest value or the lightest value? And whatever swatch I decide on, I just try to match that, you know. So 
that's probably one of the hardest things to do is finally commit to uh, all this. I'm still trying to use like um, a little bit of construction here and now with just things like um, this form wrapping around this correctly. So I still try to think about which direction these things are going. There's another lost edge here for this cup and book. All these like book leaf loose leaf papers on this book are really good little ambient occlusion generators. So that's sight size. It starts real strange, right? It feels weird to be like, here's my little lines coming down. But eventually, it turns into the whole painting, you know, or the whole picture. Try doing this with reality sometimes. Try holding your sketchbook right next to what you want to draw and see if you can uh, get pretty close. Thanks for watching.